Welcome to WatchGuard's Daily Security Byte. I'm Corey Nockreiner. Today's story is about an elusive botnet called PonmoCup. This comes from a new research report released by Fox IT, a security group. And notice I said elusive, not new. One of the major things that's interesting about PonmoCup is this botnet has been active since 2006, so just around nine years. Now there's a lot of interesting technical details about this particular botnet and how it's evolved over the years. But let's start with some stats. First of all, since 2009, according to Fox IT, this botnet has infected over 15 million victims. At its peak in 2011, it had 2.4 million victims at one time. And right now, there's about a half a million active PonmoCup victims. In any case, what's interesting about this botnet is all the ways it's evolved to stay active over the years. For instance, its delivery mechanisms. It started using some of the same old techniques, trying to pretend to be a fake video codec that people would download, or maybe trying to be a fake flash file. But since those days, the actors behind this botnet have released a new exploit kit, a web-based exploit kit, to actually force their botnet to people that visited legitimate websites. But this isn't a typical exploit kit. It doesn't necessarily take advantage of flaws in software. Rather, these bad guys, by infecting victims, learned the FTP uh, credentials for some websites, and using those credentials, they would upload some code on the website. And this code would essentially try to identify the browser of the victim and then load itself in three different types of ways. In some cases, it would try to push a Java file or a zip file, in which case it required heavy victim user interaction. But in another case, it could try to push a Java applet. And Java applets usually run in a sandboxed environment, but because these bad actors have stolen digital certificates from legitimate vendors, they can then use that that digital certificate to force this Java applet to run without any sort of user interaction, at least if you haven't updated Java lately. But what's even more interesting about the delivery mechanism is how picky these bad actors are about who they infect. When they do infect a, a legitimate site, they don't just spread the malware to anyone that visits the site. They actually pay attention to some of the redirect information. And unless the victim is coming from a search engine, a social network, or maybe a web-based mail agent, they're not going to even try to infect that victim. Also, they have a blacklist of people they're never going to try to infect, which includes security researchers. On top of that, once they try to infect a victim once, they never try to infect that victim again. And this actually makes it a lot harder for security researchers to ever run into this threat and be able to analyze it. The threat is also very evasive once it installs on your computer. You know, I've talked many times about how traditional uh, signature-based antivirus isn't good at catching threats that have many variants or that have been repacked and recrypted many times. And this malware does use those techniques. But the malware also realizes that there's sandboxes out there, so it leverages all kinds of different evasion tactics to try to detect sandboxes. And if it finds them, it's going to blacklist those computers from future infection. On top of that, usually when malware finds a sandbox, it won't run at all. This malware is trickier than that. Rather than running the real threat, it's going to run a well-known, very low-end adware-like piece of malware. The idea here is it's a smokescreen to the researcher. They see the well-known piece of adware, and they don't bother to research the malware any further, and they don't find the real intent of this particular botnet. In any case, this botnet is, is fascinating in many different technical ways, and I don't have time to go into detail. But if you're interested in that type of deep threat intelligence, I highly recommend you read the 40-page PDF that Fox IT released. Now there's good news here. This is a pretty sneaky threat, but there's a lot of easy ways to avoid it. First of all, a lot of its delivery mechanisms do require interaction. There's going to be a pop-up asking you to download a zip. There's going to be a pop-up asking you to download a jar file or Java file, and many other things like that. So if you just don't download these unsolicited files, you might be relatively safe. On top of that, patching software like Java can also protect you from some of the automated delivery methods. For instance, since the one method that used a legitimate certificate to escape Java Sandbox, the latest version of Java knows to revoke those certificates. So make sure to keep Java up to date. And finally, if you're really interested in this particular malware, at the end of that great Fox IT report, they published a ton of indicators of compromise. So 
IPs that you can blacklist, signatures for your IPS system, if you use any endpoint protection that can accept Yara signatures. So long story short, a lot of things that you can use WatchGuard network security controls to blacklist, or you can use other security controls to, to add to blacklist as well. So be sure to look at that part of the report. The last thing probably goes without saying, signature-based antivirus will often miss malware like this. And that's why you really need solutions like APT Blocker to have a chance to catch this very evasive malware. Anyways, that's the story for today. Thank you for watching.